And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. Hey folks, I'm Tom Vassell, and today we're taking a look at Lions of Lydia. Now the lions, I think, are just on the coins here of the game. The coins have lions on them, but this is a very striking cover. When I first saw this, I thought, wow, this game looks cool. And it's designed by Johnny Pack, who I played a Coloma of his, and I was very excited about this one. This one's about going to a market, pulling merchants from a bag, placing them in the market, getting resources, building buildings. You know, your typical style theme here. But like I said, this artwork really caught me, so I was very excited to try this one out. Let's take a look. Each player is going to have their own board here. This is we're going to keep track of your resources. And for lack of better terms, I'm just going to say your resources are red, yellow, blue, and green. You also have a card. You'll start with one card. This is kind of your buildings, your marketplace that you have. You have a limit to the number of cards that you can have, which is three. And as you move this across, you'll go up to five, eight, and have nine or more of these cards. This will move anytime one of your resources gets up to six. Anytime you get one of your resources up to six, you can move this, getting a bonus. This adds a merchant to the marketplace. These give you coins, and then these are worth points at the end of the game. And if you get all the way here, you can use one of your resources. In this case, green becomes wild. Um, so moving it up, also, if you get to the end six on one of these resources, you can take one of your properties and develop it for free. Properties start on a lower side, but you can develop them more where they'll be worth more points and do better things. Players' turns are going to revolve around this fountain area. On your turn, you're going to randomly pull a merchant from your bag. You start with one of every color in your bag, but after that you're going to pull one from the bag. You then have two actions. You can do a gate action, and when you have a gate action, you're just going to take this merchant and put it at any gate you want. You're then going to get a resource for every wooden piece there. So I would get one yellow resource, one blue resource, and one red resource. Later on, maybe someone else would put the green one here. Now they get one of every color. And then in the future, someone will do this. Now they get two blues, a red, a yellow, and a green. At the end of a turn, if there's a pair of the same color, they move into the fountain. You can also, if there's a gold merchant there, you can trade in that resource for coins. Coins are wild and possibly points at the end of the game. So you can just, if I, there's a gold merchant there and I can trade and I went to the red market, I could trade in three red resources for three coins. You can also place one of your merchants when you draw them from your bag, you can place it at the fountain instead of one of the markets. When that happens, you can buy cards from one of the four sides of the board. When you buy cards, you simply pay the resources at the top of the card. So for example, this costs three yellow resources. Then you have this card in front of you. It's going to be points at the end of the game, but also gives you an ability. This says when I put a yellow merchant at any of the markets, I get an extra yellow resource. Whenever you take a fountain action, you can also upgrade your cards. I can pay the cost again, flip the card over to be worth more points, and now if I put a yellow merchant at any market, I get two resources. There are three different kinds of buildings around the outside of the board. There are the gray ones, which do what I just told you. They essentially give you bonuses. There are purple ones, which can be, this one, for example, costs coins, but it can be worth more victory points and also has some sort of bonus at the end of the game. Uh, based on whatever the purple card says. Like, for example, this one here gives you points for every purple card you have at the end of the game. This one gives you points basically for how far you've moved that token at the end of the game. And then silver cards, which let you somehow get money, or just, I'm sorry, gold cards, which allow you to get coins. And again, coins are wild, so they can be useful. Players are just going to be taking turns. You're going to be putting out a, a meeple, taking a market action or fountain action at the end of your turn. You'll take a meeple from the fountain area and throw it in your bag. So your bag's always going to be constantly changing as to what's inside it. You will keep playing until one person builds a certain number of buildings, which the book tells you based on how many players. And once you've developed that many properties, and they have to be developed, 
So you have to turn them over so that this symbol is showing. Then whoever does that, whoever reaches that first, takes the fountain marker and you score points. You're going to score points for all your properties, developed or not. You're going to score for how far you moved on the board here. If you're the person with the fountain, you get one victory point for every coin that you have. And whoever has the most points is the winner of the game. Now, it's nice that they uh, have these symbols here, I guess, on these to differentiate them. But this game is not going to be colorblind friendly because it has green and red stuff. And there's no way to tell the merchants apart unless you're asking somebody else, I guess, at the table. Uh, that being said, the, the graphic design is okay for me. I'm not a huge fan. I mean, it all this stuff kind of looks very samey to me. The card quality is good. It just doesn't look that fantastic. Like when you look at these cards around the board and this stuff, I found it almost to be a little fiddly. It's good quality. It just didn't have any table presence. I should also mention that there is a ton of components included in the game and all this stuff is for in the rule book. There are eight expansions that are included with the game. Like, for example, you can play King Croesus, who basically is a wild color. When you have a merchant there, you get an extra resource, and then you move him somewhere else. And here's another thing everyone has built. And the Artisan's Guild people show up in courtyards. And so there's eight of these expansions that add some pieces. The rule books itself explains all the purple card buildings. And uh, I didn't think the rule book was difficult. And like the cover, I think this is a great picture here on the front. I just didn't see as much of that in the game itself. The mechanisms of the game, for the most part, are very clean. You are simply pulling something out of a bag, deciding where you want to put it to get resources, and that's going to kind of compile as the game goes by, because at the beginning, you have one building that gives you some stuff, and after that, you add it, and you have more buildings, and suddenly you're getting lots of resources every time, shooting those resources up, and then you have a few decisions to make. Which buildings are you going to buy? There's not that many buildings out there. There's six on each side of the board, but if I'm playing a uh, game with four players, there's not going to be that many buildings. That means I might get six total plus my original one. And then I want to upgrade those. So, I mean, I have to choose when I'm going to spend the resources, but also if I get my resources up to six, I can shoot that thing on the bottom faster. So that's interesting. The buildings pretty much all do the same thing. They give you more resources when you go to various spots, and then some give you end game victory points. You have the coins, which are wild, and there's things that you change stuff to coins, and coins could be victory points at the end of the game. And the game is essentially a race, because getting the fountain at the end could be an extra five, six victory points if you have some coins saved aside. I was just okay with the game. I really wanted to like it more than I did. Uh, pulling the person from the bag isn't really that interesting of a mechanism. I'm going to go, oh, I want to go to this market, so I want to go to the yellow market. I'll take a yellow person and throw them in my bag. Maybe that's who I'll draw. Maybe not. You know, you could have three yellows and a green, and you still pull the green. It just... it. I like, I actually, if you go look at my, my game reviews, I tend to like games where you pull things out of bags, and this one just didn't do it for me. It just wasn't an exciting option. And then you pulled it and did the markets and moved a bunch of stuff, and I was like, okay. And then just the decision to buy buildings, I just didn't feel that excited about it. Now, a couple things also on here. Uh, so the buildings themselves are random. You're going to randomly put out buildings at the beginning of the game. It's possible to be have one color be light need it. And if that's the color building you start with, I found that to be not, it didn't seem, it's not, I don't think, game breaking or anything. It is like, oh, I start, I get blue resources very easily. And there's two or three buildings out there that want blue. The rest, there's very yellow and red heavy. I thought that was odd that that came out to be that way. But it never felt like this is an engine building game where you're going to do things that give you more points, that get better, etc. for you. It never felt like it really started humming in an interesting way. Yes, near the end, I'm like, I'm getting three red, two yellow, and four blue. But it didn't go much beyond that. Then there's those eight expansions. And folks, they're not really expansions. They're like tiny variants. In fact, they feel like, to me, they feel like people played Lions of Lydia, and then someone said, all right, what would you add? And someone's like, well, I would have something that was wild. Great, expansion one. What about you? 
I've added a little chariot thing that you could add coins to if you want to. Done. Check. And that's what they feel like. And I've messed with them, and I, none of them really... They're minor variants of the game, and I feel like they should have been thrown in or not. And I don't know which ones I should play with or not. Do I play with all eight? Ah. This feels like generic Euro game. And there's a lot of games out there these days. A lot of games come out. And this is not a bad one. If you said you want to play Lines of Lydia, sure, I'll play it, you know, because it's, it's, it's fast, too. But nothing about it got me really excited. And the thing I was most excited about this cover, and I love that art, that was barely in the game. Like, the art on the cards didn't match this. So this is a pass for me, not because it's a bad game, but because it doesn't stand out in a crowd. It's not really memorable for me. And I felt like my actions were just a little more boring than I want to be. Take some resources, buy a card. Yes, a lot of games can be boiled down to that. But those games make me feel like I'm having more fun. With Lines and Lydia, I could see the mechanisms more easily than I want it to. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching a review of Lines and Lydia on the Dice Tower. Dice Tower Judgment, interesting, but left me a little cold.